Hi everybody, welcome to module five, our last module for this course. I should say last content module for this course. So today we are shifting gears, moving across the Atlantic into the Americas to talk about the ways in which complex societies emerged in the North and South American context and to compare them to the civilizations that we talked about in module four. For today's class, I want to start in North America and talk about two large city-states located thousands of miles apart and occupied roughly around the same time, Chaco Canyon in New Mexico and Cahokia in Illinois. So most standard textbooks for world archaeology classes like ours don't even talk about places like Chaco and Cahokia as complex societies. Instead, these two urban centers are generally skipped over in favor of Mesoamerican and Andean city-states like the Maya, Inca, and Aztec, which we'll talk about in, in lectures 5.2 and 5.3. So one of the big questions that arises here is why places like Cahokia and Chaco seem to be excluded from discussions of civilizations. To answer this question, let's return to the features of complex societies that we talked about in module 4.1. If we think back to module four, where we define these kind of key criteria of complex societies, you'll remember that archeologists typically think about civilizations as containing material evidence of large settlements, hierarchical social organizations, taxation and standardization, writing and mathematics, monumental architecture, and formal religious complexes. As we'll talk about today, Chaco and Cahokia have almost all of these features, with the key exception of a written language. There's currently no evidence from people living at Cahokia or Chaco that they were writing anything down. I would argue, however, that this insistence on writing as a key criteria for classifying civilizations reflects biases inherent in Western scholarship who tend to compare all sorts of cultures both in the present and the past to Western society. As a result, any culture that doesn't have characteristics similar to Western societies doesn't typically count as being civilized or complex. So the goal of, my, of the class today is for you to decide, based on the evidence I present, whether you think that Chaco and Cahokia should or shouldn't be discussed alongside other complex civilizations in China, Mesopotamia, Southeast Asia, as well as South America. So let's start with Chaco. So Chaco Canyon has contains evidence for early sedentary village structures around 500 AD. During the 800s AD, summer rainfall was highly variable. In response to this variable climate, instead of dispersing, people in the region began to aggregate into what's, what is now the San Juan Basin. By roughly 1050 AD, it's estimated that over 5,000 people were living at Chaco Canyon. Chaco became the center of a vast regional, ceremonial, administrative, and economic system around this time. Chaco itself consists of dozens of great houses, which are connected together through a series of road networks. Great houses are massive multi-story structures with as many as 600 rooms. In contrast to the usual practice of just adding rooms to existing structures, these great houses were planned from the start. So we see here at Chaco evidence for organized, planned, structural creation. These large Pueblos room blocks would have taken several decades, perhaps even centuries, to complete. During the mid to late 800s AD, 
The great houses of Pueblo Bonita, Unavida, and Penasco Blanco were constructed at Chaco. These structures were oriented along solar, lunar, and cardinal directions. These structures represent sophisticated astrolo astrological markers and also contain communication features, water control devices, and formal earthen mounds. Great houses were not traditional farming villages um, occupied by large populations. Instead, these forms of public architecture were likely used only periodically during times of ceremony, commerce, and trade. These kind of temporary populations would congregate together from the surrounding areas of the San Juan Basin for these important ceremonial or trading events, rather than living at Chaco full time. Great houses served as community centers, basically places where the populations from smaller sites surrounding Chaco could come together, work together, and participate in ceremonial events. One of these kind of great house outliers is called Pueblo Pintado, which is about 16 miles east of Chaco. Based on the extent of roads and the presence of a similar layout at Pueblo Pintado, we can assume that this, that this Pueblo was part of what, what is called the Chaco Phenomenon, a kind of emerging central complex of, of smaller sites linked together by this grand site uh, at Chaco Canyon. The largest great house at Chaco Canyon is called Pueblo Bonito, which is a huge D-shaped complex of at least 600 rooms and could likely house a roughly a thousand people, if not more. The room complexes themselves are surrounded by courts with high, high stories in the back. We also see at Pueblo Bonito 32 kivas and three great kivas. Great kivas were up to 60 feet in diameter with wide masonry benches encircling the interior. A staircase would lead down from the top floor of the kiva into this large room and was used as a sacred precinct in which ceremonial events occurred. Kivas still are used by Pueblo people today, so we see a kind of continuation of this kind of early ceremonial tradition that we see at Chaco up until the 21st century. In addition to these 32 great kivas at Chaco, as well as all of these large great houses like Pueblo Benito, Chaco Canyon contains 400 miles of roads that link this ceremonial center to 30 different outlying settlements. Other roads connect Chaco to natural resources, areas like the Zuni Salt Lake. These roads were up to 40 feet wide and were cut a few inches into the soil and often marked with low rock walls. The road network at Chaco runs for long, distance, long distances, in one instance up to 60 miles. This kind of massive road construction work must have involved the use of large numbers of people and considerable centralized group organization. You can see behind me in the map the series of 30 different outlier Chaco outlying settlements as well as the road networks that, that connect them. So there's no writing that we have at Chaco Canyon to date, but there is lots of rock art, which has similar ways of depicting kind of ideas and history, except in the form of kind of abstract objects um, and figures as opposed to written text. Rock art, like writing, is used to tra transmit ideas and beliefs. We see all sorts of rock art images at Chaco, including spirals, hatching, stylized humans, flute players, hands, mountain sheep, birds, and insects. We also see the depiction of clan symbols, as well as the narration of migration events. 
One particularly notable piece of rock art from Chaco is called the Sun Dagger. The Sun Dagger image depicted behind me is located on top of an imposing butte at the entrance to Chaco Canyon. Two giant spirals are positioned next to each other and likely functioned as solar markers. During the summer solstice in June, a vertical shaft of light pierces through the main spiral exactly at the center, a phenomenon shown in this image. At winter solstice, two shafts of light lift to the left um, of this spiral bracketed. The light shafts strike smaller, uh, the smaller spiral nearby during the spring and fall equinoxes. These petroglyphs were a form of calendrical recording that marked important times of the year, likely linked to ceremonies, as well as planting and harvesting seasons. Over one million artifacts have been collected from Chaco across these 120 different sites. These artifacts include things like distinctive black on white ceramics, as well as pro uh, produced and traded utilitarian goods like projectile points and knives. We also see, in addition to these kind of local trade goods, evidence for the exchange of exotic goods, including turquoise from places like Cerrillos, New Mexico, uh, which were used to make ornaments, pendants, and beads. We also see exotic goods for that offer evidence for long distance trade in the form of macaws, copper, and shells from places like California, as well as Mexico. Macaws are particularly interesting because we have evidence from Latin America and Central America for the ritual use of macaw feathers on prayer sticks, costumes, masks. And the idea here was that these kind of objects were used to communicate with the spiritual world. The artifactual evidence at Chaco demonstrates the existence of a long distance trade network across the American Southwest and into Central America. These artifacts are, these exotic artifacts are also, also provide preliminary evidence for the the emergence of social hierarchy. One of these kind of social hierarchies, one, of, one type of evidence that we have for the emergence of social hierarchy comes from burial context, particularly burial 33 at Pueblo Benito. This burial contains 14 stacked burials, one on top of each other. In one of these burials at, in, in area 33, in room 33, we see two men surrounded by extravagant grave goods, including thousands of pieces of turquoise beads and shells from the Pacific Ocean. Associated with these two elite male burials were female bodies. Recent ancient DNA research conducted by the National Museum of history in New York point to the presence of a grandmother-grandson and mother-daughter pair in this elaborate burial context. This pairing of grandmother-grandson and mother-daughter offers preliminary evidence for hereditary rule led by women. The diagram behind me provides a hypothetical uh, outline of the Chacoan matrilineal line and system of rule. So the matrilineal members are highlighted in red, and the blue here shows the grandmother-grandson relationship suggested from the testing of crania 8 and 10 from room block 33. The blue with two asterisks after it shows the mother-daughter relationship shown from ADNA taken from crania 1 and 7 from this same room block. So 
What we know from Chaco so far is that there was definitely social hierarchy and that women were likely in charge of much of the ceremonial life at Chaco based on this kind of preliminary evidence from human remains at burial 33. So what was Chaco actually used for? What were these women actually doing, right? So Chaco was likely used for a couple of different purposes, including as a ceremonial gathering place, a food distribution center, and an exchange hub for exotic goods. In the 1100s, new construction at Chaco began to slow, and its role as a regional center began to shift. By the 1200s, people were moving away from Chaco and migrating into new areas to the north, south, and west of the San Juan Basin, eventually dispersing into much smaller settlements that make up the ancestral sites of contemporary Pueblo peoples. So in the remainder of class today, I'd like to switch gears and focus on Cahokia. So Cahokia was the largest pre-Columbian city north of Mexico during the 11th through 13th century. It developed into this large-scale settlement after 800 AD, roughly the same time as Chaco. Cahokia was a city that at its peak was larger than many European cities, including medieval London. There are some signs that individuals achieved greater social and political importance in what had previously been a very egalitarian form of social relationship in the Cahokia area. As we start to see more hierarchical um, social systems develop in this area, we also see the construction of large oval mounds, which we'll get into in a little bit. So around 1000 AD, previously dispersed populations in the Midwest and Southeast begin to congregate at Cahokia. And, trans and this kind of aggregation becomes a tightly integrated society consisting of a kind of three-tiered hierarchical system in which the capital was seated at Cahokia and then there were several smaller kind of political and administrative centers to the kind of east and west of Cahokia, followed by what we might think of as kind of rural homesteads in the northern part of the general region. So everything was organized at the center with Cahokia, with distribution of goods and resources moving down this hierarchy from these larger regional centers into these rural homesteads. One of these kind of, uh, one of the kind of archaeological evidence that we have for the emergence of social hierarchy and stratification associated with this three-tiered system is Mound 72 which contains two men laying out on a platform of 20,000 shell beads. Altogether, Mound 72 contains over 250 bodies, many of them which pro provide evidence of human sacrifice. The analysis of, the, of these male bodies indicate that the primary men laying out on these 20,000 shell beads consumed large amounts of meat, suggesting that they were likely elite members of society. In addition to these, these um, biological indications of a very elite diet, along with human sacrifice and lots of uh, shell beads, at Mount 72, we also see 800 arrowheads, copper sheets, 15 polished stone discs used in, spear th in a spear throwing game, laying out alongside of these two elite men. Nearby to their bodies are the bodies of four men with their heads and hands cut off. More than 50 young women between the ages of 18 to 23 are also buried in a pit close by. The this kind of hierarchical set of social relationships at 
Cahokia was organized through a highly centralized economy where foodstuffs and communal labor were appropriated by the elite, people like those buried at Mound 72. Most prestige objects at Cahokia were manufactured at the site and made from local materials for domestic use. This really contrasts with Chaco, where we see elite goods that were acquired through long-distance exchange, like turquoise and macaw feathers. Cahokia's leaders achieved dominance by basically appropriating everything to themselves and then redistributing what they viewed as a as necessary to these other regional and rural settlements. Cahokia, Cahokian society was fueled by a complex ceremonial system based on warfare, fertility, and ancestor worship. The warfare cult itself was, a group, was made up of a group of elite nobles ba- and was based on warfare. These nobles were part of particular kin groups and are associated with exotic uh, the depiction of exotic motifs and symbols on costly raw materials like seashells or imported copper. Evidence for this war-based cult uh, appears in the form of exotic cosmic imagery depicting animals, humans, and mythic beasts, which bound together warfare, cosmology, and nobility. Kokia religion itself seems to have merged beliefs about life and death with the movement of the stars, sun, and moon. Specific deities were recognized to, to be female goddesses, which were often depicted on small redstone sculptures like some of those depicted behind me. The goddesses in these kind of depictions are often shown with the bones of the dead, as well as a monstrous mythical serpent as, and corn crops. These depictions offer a kind of connection between life, death, and femininity, and were likely used in order to ensure a good harvest. So we have war cults, we have fertility cults, and we also see at at Cahokia evidence for ancestor worship, seen through temple statuary representing men and women women kneeling in death-like poses. A key component to this ceremonial complex was the construction of massive earthen mounds. At the height of Cahokia's occupation, between 1050 and 1250 AD, the inhabitants of the site erected over a hundred different earthen mounds. Three different types of mounds were made at Cahokia, but the most common one was this platform mound style, thought to have been a monumental structure particularly used for political and religious ceremonies. These mounds were grouped around an open central plaza and made entirely out of earth, which workers brought in on their backs in baskets. The largest of these mounds at Cahokia is referred to as Monk's Mound. Here's an image of Monk's Mound, which was built on four levels over the course of 300 years. Monk's Mound stands over 100 feet high and covers roughly 16 acres. It's accompanied by a grand plaza and a group of smaller mounds walled in together through a two-mile-long wooden palisade. As many as 20,000 wooden posts were used to construct this defensive wall around the mound. So... Chaco and Cahokia both show evidence of elaborate kind of ceremonial complexes, evidence for redistribution and hierarchy, and the construction of monumental forms of architecture. Like Chaco, Cahokia doesn't last forever, and eventually people begin to disperse. Some of the reasons why we see this dispersion at Cahokia are the result of severe droughts in the late 1100s and again in the early 1200s. We also see climate cooling around this same time period, making the production of surplus maize growth very difficult. 
There's also evidence for increased political tensions during the late 1100s in the form of defensive palisades that are constructed around Cahokia, presumably to defend against external threats. Finally, the dispersion or deaggregation of Cahokia may have been the result of internal tensions among the diverse array of ethnic groups which made up this major urban city center. So let's go back to the question that we asked at the beginning of today's class, this civilization debate. So let's think about these criteria and whether Cahokia and Chaco count. So first, large settlements with complex social organizations. Definitely, Chaco and Cahokia both had large estimated populations in the thousands and were certainly aggregational centers within both Illinois and New Mexico. What about taxation and hierarchy? So we definitely have evidence from both Chaco and Cahokia for extreme levels of social disparity, seen primarily through burial records in which we see elite burials wh where these, uh, these individuals had better diets, more grave goods, uh, which offers some evidence for social hierarchy. We also see evidence for redistribution, particularly at places like Cahokia, which was this kind of central space where foodstuffs as well as exotic trade goods were aggregated and then dispersed through this three-tiered hierarchy. Monumental architecture. Definitely, definitely, right? We have monumental architecture at, at Chaco and at Cahokia in the form of large mounds, as well as at Chaco in the form of these large Pueblo complexes like Pueblo Bonito behind me. So definitely monumental architecture is on the list. In addition, we also see evidence for formal for a formal religious complex. So at at Chaco, we see the evidence of elite burials, uh, kiva spaces where religious ceremonies took place. At uh, Cahokia, we see these mound complexes, things like Monk's Mound, that were likely associated with this fertility, war, ancestor worship cults. So the main question is, does writing matter to actually classify civilizations? And that's a debate that only you guys can answer for yourself. See you in module 5.2.